Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Nature Connection Show with Lisa and Nancy, publishers of Big Blend Magazines and nature photographer Margot Carrera. Welcome, everybody. Today, Margot and I are so excited to have environmental attorney, historian, and author Lowell E. Bear joining us. Uh, he I has got uh, uh, the book. It's called The Codex of the Endangered mm-hmm. Species Act, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And we're really looking at the last 50 years of the Endangered Species Act through these books and the next 50 years, because right now we're at the point of celebrating the Endangered Species Act. And I love it that he's here today because, you know, we do these shows every fourth Friday, our Nature Connection show. Thank and you. today happens to fall on International Environmental Education Day. So I love that. So welcome to the show, Lowell. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Well, I'm delighted to be here and I look forward to uh, visiting with you. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to touch on the, just the, the history. You've done so much in regards to wildlife conservation and also looking at our natural resources, which, of course, are all connected. And you've written numerous books. Um, and I encourage everyone to go to your website, too. That That's that's an important part of it. They can really connect with you there. And that will all be linked in the show notes. Um, but can can you give us just before we get started, a little overview of how the Endangered Species Act came to be and how it's kind of changed because, as I recall, when that happened, it was kind of like the country got behind it, no matter what political party. And now it it, it feels like we could get in trouble with it. Well, yeah. Uh, the uh, act grew out of, a, out of the 60s and 70s. That was... <clears throat> what is known as the Green Revolution, when America really took stock of their species, their their air quality, their water quality, and their whole, their their overall environment, and they um, um, began to get concerned really about it when <clears throat> the whales uh, were in the headlines as being totally endangered and being a. a, a killed off the polar and the grizzly bears, black-footed ferrets, um, and the um, elephants, striped cats, condors, the whoopee grains, and the bald eagles. They were all at risk of extinction back in in the 60s. And so the Congress, sensing the mood of the country and the need to protect these uh, species at risk, uh, enacted uh, the first endangered species law, which was more aspirational than anything in 1966. And then they amended in 1969 to enlarge uh, its reach beyond the borders of America. And then in 1973, uh, they, they realized they really needed to put more teeth into it. And so in 73, they totally rewrote the act and, and adopted uh, the best parts of uh, the 66 and 69 law. But it was the, 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 the United States uh, concern, the, the people rose up as they saw whales disappearing, polar and grizzly bears, uh, whooping cranes, and so forth. So that's where the sensitivity of the public began. Wow. Did, did also having the EPA get started just a few years before, which people are still in shock that it was Nixon who signed it, you know, um, having the EPA come in. Do you think that helped the Endangered Species Act get passed as well, just having that kind of success? Oh, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> the EPA is in charge of our, our water quality and air quality, uh, but they are also in charge of the compounds that are used in the industrial world and in the agricultural world that put chemicals out into the air and the ground. Uh, Nitrous uh, uh, fertilizer, herbicides, uh, pesticides, and and, and other chemical drugs to deal with insects and to improve the yields of of the crops. And uh, it was just totally out of control uh, when uh, um, Rachel Carson wrote her book Mm -hmm. about... uh, this this uh, growing, growing, growing concern, and uh, so that's what drove the the the, uh, the Congress into 
um, getting tough by creating a law that really had a lot of teeth into it and had enforceability, which the 66 and 69 laws did not. Mm. I, I think it's interesting about the Endangered Species Act, too, because it makes people look at the species and look at, um, you know, why are they dying, right? So there's some yes. places we've been, like Pinnacles National Park in California is one where we learned, you know, they that's where they're bringing back the condors. And it's being very, it's really a very successful program. But we found out why are, why were the condors dying off? And it turned out to be uh, lead bullets um, by hunters and farmers and, you know, and, and the lead, yeah, the lead in, in the bullets. And so that would end up, you know, the, like the ravens and the vultures and, and all these animals would end up swallowing them and dying. And this was part of the problem. So we, what, the Endangered Species Act from, you know, the places we've been across the country in public lands, it seems to me that it, it sheds light not only on the species that maybe people didn't know about and then care about whether or not they saw them, which I find interesting about the whales, how that worked. Um, saving whales, you may never, you could have been in the Midwest and never seen a whale, but you're, you're going to stand up for the whale. But I think it it really also gives an idea of, like going back to the EPA and, and looking after the actual land, right? The water and, and, and all of that, that it gives us this insight into the habitat. You know, there's all these different laws on, you know, how much you can hunt or don't, don't hunt this or don't do that. But at the same time, if we don't look at the habitat, isn't that almost one of the biggest threats to the species that we have in the world? And not just animals. We're talking about, you know, uh, a fauna as well, flora, <laughs> flora and fauna together. Well, it, absolutely. <clears throat> um, the <clears throat> the <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> the Endangered Species Act, very first um, provision on page one, said that the pers- purpose of this act is to protect. The, the, all the ecosystems and the natural, natural habitats upon which our species live. That was number one. <clears throat> and then next and beyond that was um, endangering either the habitat or the uh, life or the uh, breeding cycles and so forth of species at risk. So there were two really focuses of the law, but the very first one that you've already put your finger on <clears throat> was protecting the habitat. Hmm. Excellent. Because that's it. Now, I mean, that's... Now, that's... now I, I, I should say one other thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the, unfortunately, the regulators... <clears throat> after the act was passed, really focused on the species and not the habitat. And mm. <clears throat> the determination of, ha- of critical habitat has always been at issue in the enforcement of, of the act. It's always been an issue. Mm. <clears throat> that's, that, that's something we've come across is that, you know, even if you create a law, it's about having the manpower to enforce the law and to keep the law going. I mean, I, part of why we do our public lands and park documentation and going and researching is, is we finding out that it was because of the, the lack of funding, honestly. And, um, and our, our parks and, and public lands are threatened on a daily basis from fracking and mining, um, all kinds of things, uh, oil. I mean, I was just in a national wildlife refuge um, about a month ago uh, filming snow geese and right next to them in the same pond is oil, an oil derrick right there. And but they're living there. Everyone's happy. But I just always go like, how can that be good? Like, I don't know. You know, it's just how when it became a wildlife refuge, they were saving this land. And, and a lot of times the wildlife refuges our old ranch lands, which it was, um, this is out in Texas, and they just had not purchased the mineral rights at the same time. Um, I don't know if people just 
blatantly forget that kind of thing. I'm not sure um, about all the laws that went in when they purchased this, but so the the oil is going, and it's one of the top wild you know bird migratory destinations in the country. So it's really weird to see. I still just can't get quite past that seeing an oil going at the same time. But I feel like our our world is having to get into this very odd coexistence and it's not necessarily the best thing because if if we lose our species does it not in the end affect humans when we lose the species well it's it's um liz it's uh or lisa it's lisa, it's okay right? lisa yes. uh, that is um a, a good uh observation uh let me put it in 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 this fashion um all if you picture a big green balloon, big round green balloon, and in that is are all the living organisms of the earth, from micro or organisms all the way up to the megafauna, like the the, the elephants or the polar bears. <clears throat> and as each of those go, go extinct within that big green balloon, a little air is left out. And um, what will eventually happen, not this century, probably not the next, but in the for in the future, the air will be so low in that balloon that man, who depends upon nature to survive, will be at risk of extinction himself. And wow. and that is that that's what you have just suggested, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I fully agree with that observation because we look to nature. We man look to nature for our food, our clothing, our shelter, and our, our medicines. Just, just, you know, as well as our livelihood, jobs. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, um, uh, as we lose the biodiversity that makes up our planet, uh, we will eventually be at risk ourselves. Mm. Wow, and, and Margo, that, that green, big green balloon will collapse, and and that's the end of mankind. The green mm-hmm. balloon thing—that's what Margo. I was just like, that's probably the best way I've ever heard it on the show. That's the a great, green, yeah, it is example. Yeah, I I think that one thing um, I don't know if it's done in the school systems, but when I studied back back in the sixties and seventies. <laughs> um, uh, we learned about ecosystems and biodiversity, and it was part of our education. I wonder if schools are teaching this so that these generations growing up understand how important these ecosystems are and for the life of, like you said, all the way to humanity. Um, it's one thing maybe we could ask uh, government or, or those in, in the know to uh, put back into education um, of our children and next generations so they can I, understand I, what's going on. I don't know, Margot, about mm-hmm. what you can or can't do with our educational system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I see books being banned in Florida and other states, I begin to scratch my head and wonder. Mm-hmm. The, the, the best source of information for students that I've ever seen comes out of the National Wildlife Federation that has mm-hmm. multiple pro- yes. programs across the country to educate our youth and our kids. Mm-hmm. In, Ranger um, Rick. <laughs> yes, in, in um, the natural world and the relationship of man to the natural world. Yeah. I, I, I think you're really right about this, the banning of books and, and things like that. It's, I think, you know, as families and parents, and I think the parks, the park system themselves do a really good job of going in with, um, you know, junior ranger programs and things like that. But I think we're having, we as society need to look at kids having like green schools. And I know there are some, like, I think there's one in Bali. There's different green schools where kids even get to go outside, you know, 
I mean, mm. it's when I, I was in school, we went outside a lot, you know, and um, you got to learn about biodiversity because, you know, even if you walk across a field, right, as a kid, you're like, what? And then all of a sudden you start seeing all the different beetles and all the little butterflies and all the birds and you start seeing the ants and you start seeing, oh, wait, there's not just one type of grass. Oh, wow, there's a forb over here. There's a this there, you know. And yeah. so I think we have to change our school system 100 percent. And in some ways, homeschool is good, but then it could be weird depending on who's the homeschool person. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If that can get I, weird. Um, I would suggest, however that we leave it to groups like the National uh, Wildlife Federation and others that do a uniform program across the country. Mm -hmm. If Mm -hmm. you leave it to the states, uh, each state is going to be different as to what they deem appropriate to to teach our youth. Mm -hmm. And some may intentionally leave out or unintentionally some of the most important factors of that education. And so... um, um, I would I would strongly suggest that the national programs that are controlled by our NGOs NGOs are far better uh, mm. than than uh, I, the uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to agree. Uh, yes, leaving it up to individual states, which is exactly, ladies, which is exactly why the Congress <clears throat> decided that the Endangered Species Act of 1973 would be a federal program. Um, managed out of Washington with one voice, mm-hmm. and 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 it applied to all the states equally. Uh, they did not trust the the states mm-hmm. to be uniform in what they would deem to be uh, species at risk, and not they would have different programs. And w- what the Congress, when you read all of the all of the uh, congressional testimony and the floor debates, et cetera, and for, throughout 1972 and 73, there was a constant battle of, well, who's going to who's going to have priority here, mm-hmm. states or federal government? Right down to the last minute when mm-hmm. they when the gavel went down, um, what's his name, uh, Ted Stevens from Alaska was arguing that <clears throat> the states had to be in charge, and mm-hmm. Congress deemed otherwise appropriately so because then. One voice controls it, and mm-hmm. one voice sets the standards. It, and that's that's the importance. Like when we look at parks and public lands, you know, there's state parks. Some state parks are just flourishing and doing amazing. But you can go around the corner and go, oh my gosh, you know. I mean, I remember us doing shows um, about a decade ago when um, California said it was like, oh, we're closing, you know, a third of our our state parks, and we're like, you know bleep bleep what and and then suddenly they found the money that was hidden somewhere um and when these kinds of acts were not not acts like the one you're talking about the endangered species act that's federal and it goes through so many layers to get to finally get it to happen right but when it comes to state or county there's things that gets um you know any holiday you know, Memorial Day, 4th of July, for some reason, there's some sneaky bill that someone's trying to pass over those holidays. And that was one about closing the state parks. And um, I don't know, actually, it's way now, I think it's way more than a decade. It's like 15 years ago. And remember, it was when Twitter first started. We used Twitter to get everyone in California to sign. And we had um, a congressperson who yelled at us and, and pulled his fax machine out because of us. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was great. I'm like, whatever. But we got our parks back. Um, But it was one of those weird things. But federal is the highest form of protection. Federal is like, that's why the National Park Service is so important, um, because that is federal. It's the highest form of protection that you can get. Um, And it's like our military. You know, you can't have... And and it's uniform protection. Yes. Yes, exactly. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. People, you know, people say to us all the time, well, what's the difference if you go into a forest and a national park? Well, a forest, I remember asking a, a forest ranger years ago on a, on a live broadcast and we were actually out there and she said, well, you know, here you can come cut down your Christmas tree. And I looked and I'm like, what? Um, you know, and, and she's like, yes. And I said, well, what if you run out? She goes, oh, we'll never run out. And I'm like, oh, you need to retire or something. <laughs> I don't know what to yes. say to you, you know. 
Um, so it's, there's different laws, like you said, but it is uniform across the board and it's really important. And these, these kinds of acts like the Endangered Species Act, wasn't it up, wasn't it threatened just a few years ago to actually be dissolved or? Well, um, uh, Lisa, the, uh, I hate to give you this statistic, but it's important. Since 1995, there have been 608 bills in Congress, the House and the Senate, which were designed to neuter the Endangered Species Act, uh, 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 withdraw it, and and, and, uh, uh, make it non-existent, uh, or dumb it down in many ways where it would be not uh, effective at all. 608 since 1995. This Congress alone, this Congress alone, there are uh, over 50 bills in the House and the Senate right now which which are attempting to um, dumb it down or with, totally withdraw it. Oh. It's under constant attack. And there have been only three major amendments. And uh, the last one was 1988. And the reason there are no more amendments in Congress is because well, the Conservation Committee is very concerned about putting uh, the act uh, into the dialogue of the Congress mm. uh, because they may monkey around with it and begin through the back door to try to dumb it down. So what we've done in order to manage the change in America that was never anticipated in 1973 in which the act really didn't provide for uh, has been handled through regulations issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. When the act was passed in 73, um, it took a couple of years to create the regulations, but the regulations were uh, only, uh, let's see, 50 pages long. Those regulations today are 5,000 pages long, 5,000. And that's because the, um, the federal government through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that's a part of the Department of Interior, <clears throat> in order to better manage change and address the things that were not anticipated in 73, have created a regulatory regime that's necessary. I give you an example. Back in 73, we never anticipated climate change, invasive right. species, wildlife, uh, international wildlife uh, 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 trading of, of, of endangered species mm -hmm. and, and, and selling them around the country. Um, and so forth. I'll stop there. But there were many, many things that were never anticipated in 73 that the act, as strict as it is, wasn't designed to to address. And so we've had to address them through regulations. But it's handled well, again. Yeah. The regulations are handled again by one office. Wow. So that's all through the interior. Um, and so, and, and fish and, and fish and game, fish and wildlife, they've changed their name over the years. You know, it's interesting because they do mostly the wildlife refuges. And what I've seen traveling the country is, well, I've seen issues in regards to water rights for the wildlife refuges. We've been to some of the top, top wetlands for birds. And I'm, I'm literally just in tears filming dust devils where there's no water. And I've been there at the time, the time the birds come in. And it's just barren and started doing some research. And, and it turns out just water rights and communities fighting over it and somehow our, our wildlife refuges and things are in trouble. Yet they're the place that we need. They, they have some of the best programs, the actual fish and uh, game and fish and wildlife uh, in wildlife refuges in regards to bringing monarchs back. And they have, you know, monarch way stations and they do so much to teach kids about that. When we talk about, you know, that kind of education, they're really good at that. Um, mm -hmm. But on the, on, I mean, I've seen good, bad and ugly in all public land. Sorry, it's true. And that's why we do what we do. But I just feel like we, I'm really glad you're on the show and that you've written these two books and your other books too. Um, really looking at, you know, 
the first year, volume one, first, uh, first 50 years, volume two, going into the next 50, 50 years. And everyone, again, it's the Codex of the Endangered Species Act. And you have all these, um, you know, articles within it. You have actual uh, stories. It's almost like an anthology of all these specialists and conservationists writing about ideas and what we need to do to move forward. But I just, I, I don't know. I think Margot, Nancy, and I always feel this urgency because we do see things um, happen. You're very right about the federal need because it, it shenanigans happen in, in communities. Um, and shenanigans happens anything in politics, right? But I mean, I, I don't know how we can get this water back for some of the, this is like in the north, uh, northwest part of Texas panhandle going into New Mexico. It, and it's, and it's real, man. It's like, what, you know, um, how do we help on that? And at the same time, I'm seeing monarchs being pulled off the endangered species list going, we're not quite done yet. So I don't know how does, how do, I know that's 20 questions in one, but what can we do as citizens of this country or even visitors coming over to this country? What can we do to make sure things are protected? Like, you know, the water rights that, that the people, the powers that be did go and make sure that water went into that wildlife refuge. What can we do to make sure that these endangered species are being protected? Because I think there are rules in place, but sometimes they just don't get acted out. And I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but it's true because we don't have the manpower, the budget that goes towards it, I think. Uh, it's a, a lot of, there are a lot of questions that you've asked. I know, read. sorry. <laughs> but, but, it was but a bit of a rant. Pick and choose. Pick and choose. It's a rant. It was a rant. But, <laughs> it was a rant. <laughs> but let me focus on what you can, what the public can do. Yes. Uh, first of all, money funding is a major, that's the Achilles heel of the Endangered Species Act in dealing with species in crisis. Uh, Debbie Dingell from Michigan, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, that replaced uh, her uh, her uh, a spouse uh, when he died, uh, John Dingell. Actually, before he, when he retired, she took his job. And Martin Heinrich from New uh, New Mexico, Senator Heinrich, were the two <clears throat> guiding lights to to create a bill in Congress called. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act, RAWA, R-A-W-A. And that has now been in, it's now been, this is the third Congress that it's now been, been in and still hasn't been passed because the Congress has not been able to come together to figure out how we pay for this. Because under RAWA, automatically every year, $1.4 billion that's $1.4 billion are distributed to the states and the tribes across the country to deal with species at risk and endangered species. We've got to get more money into the system. That was well thought out, that particular law, and uh, Congress cannot seem to get its act together to, to respond accordingly. So what we can do as citizens is talk to our congressmen and their senators when you see them because they're all over the place now running for office and talk to them about it and ask them why have they supported it and what more support can they give it? That's one thing we can do. The other thing is to, is to, um, let me think. Oh, protect the endangered species act at all cost because, um, the Congress, as I said, have had over 50 bills right now in the house and Senate to try to dumb it down and repeal it and let your congressmen and senators know that at all costs, we protect the Endangered Species Act and we don't dumb it down and we don't change it. Those are two big things. Mm -hmm. And believe me, these congressmen and senators, I, 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 I know them well. I'm in Washington now 60 years since I graduated from law school. Wow. Uh, and I've been here 60 years, but I came here when I was 16 as a page boy in the U.S. House of Representatives. And so I've really had, over my lifetime, a real indoctrination of how these men and women in our, our, our elected legislators think. 
and they're thinking about re-election right now. And they're and this is a, a perfect time to talk to them because mm-hmm. they're out generating votes. They're accessible, uh, and uh, these are two points uh, uh, that you could, that a, a, a regular citizen can talk to them about mm-hmm. passing, and- uh, getting money for the Endangered Species Act through RAWA, R-A-W-A, and secondly, supporting the Endangered Species Act and not changing it. Now, this is there, really there, important. There, 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 there are some other things that I can go on about, but mm-hmm. I'll stop right there because those are the two most important things. Yeah, I think this is important because it is, you know, election time. And also, you know, it. I think a lot of times... I. America's kind of fed up and frustrated and um we're always looking also just at the presidents, right? And I think we yep. should always look at who our Congress people are as well, um, and Senate. And and you really, you know, get in get in there and, and let them know. And it's not a um it, this is not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's the same thing as our national parks. No. When they've done no. they've done so many studies both parties care. The Green Party does, the Progressive Party, the Independent, the Libertarians, all parties care about these places. But it needs to be on, on the, you know, we need to really kind of push it as, as individuals, no matter who we're, you know, looking at voting for. And almost, I would almost say like, put your money with the people that do vote for conservation. That's yes. kind of where I'm at because, yeah. you know, exactly. I, I'm, <laughs> if I'm going to give money away to someone running, it's going to be someone that's doing something for the best interest of our country. Hold them, you know? hold them accountable. That's what money does. It holds yeah. them accountable. So you and think it still them. works? Like still talking to them works. I have to ask that. I have to go back to that because I think a lot of people have kind of just gone like, you know, whatever. They're, they're so fed up right now at the country. Yeah. So do we still need to be the squeaky wheel? Absolutely. And they are accessible. My golly, are they accessible right now? And they're vulnerable because they all want to get reelected. And mm. this is a great time to talk to them. Margo? Oh, I was just totally agreeing with you. And um, I was just thinking about what can we do to um, get the word out about what's needed about uh changes uh that are being proposed and um how can we i I mean these are done in the back office aren't they sir um so uh, the general public doesn't know that all these bills are out there unless they you know watch um you know online uh what's going on in in the senate and the congress and not that many people spend their day watching that. So how do we know uh, what these bills are are being proposed to dumb it down other than to have someone wonderful like you come out and share your your knowledge with us and and uh, have them read your book? And um, what do you want um, them to know about uh, what's going on? Well, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the question, Margaret. Yeah, where, how can people keep up with the bills? Like, oh, oh, for, oh, oh, for oh, conservation. Well, yeah, where, that others... is very difficult. That's very difficult because just watching the action on the C-SPAN on the floor of the House or Senate, you're not going to learn anything from that, mm-hmm. unless it's a, a serious debate just before a bill is going to be um, voted upon. Uh, these bills, when they are filed, get reported in the Federal Register. Now, nobody is going to spend their time reading the Federal Register. My God, it's anywhere mm-hmm. from a half an inch to an inch daily that comes out that, that it contains not, not only <clears throat> all the, the dialogue on the, on the floors of the House and Senate, but, it, it, but, but the bills that are being introduced are all printed in that. And the only way you can really stay abreast of what's going on is being close to organizations that constantly watch them and report it. I mean, the Sierra Club, the National Wildlife Federation, uh, and other conservation groups 
mm-hmm. repeatedly put out newsletters and other releases that tell tell the general public what the heck is going on. Yeah, in in Aud- Washington. Audubon, yeah, they and do. Audubon, thank you. And and the best thing to do is <clears throat> is be a subscriber to their news releases and watch them. They'll tell mm-hmm. you when when there's a problem. Uh, That's right. The other thing, the other thing, uh, if I may go back, you said, "What else, what can we do as a as a public?" I said, "You know, uh, hold strong on not touching the Endangered Species Act." Number one, funding is number two, but the third thing is is educating our youth. Now, at this point, the listeners have children and grandchildren. And great grandchildren that they're that they are raising up, and introducing them and engaging them to the natural world, starting with their backyards and their gardens, and their local parks and the seashores and the and the mountains and so forth, and 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 talk to them. Just sit on the deck and talk to them quietly. Have just silence. Listen to the birds and the insects, and look at the stars, and begin to get them engaged with the natural world you you said it before when you cross a a, a field all of the all of the mm. all of the life uh, that you that you can witness in just walking across a, a field is unbelievable but you've got to have mentors working with the kids working with these young people to introduce get them off the, the basketball courts get them off their computers and out into nature. Mm. Uh, Boy Scouts do a great job. I'm an old mm-hmm. Boy Scout, and Boy mm-hmm. Scouts do a great job as well as uh, you know through their camping and and other programs. Hey, Boy Scouts have done a lot of um, shelters and parks, <clears throat> built a lot of. You know, it's almost like the you know the the CC. They've done a lot. You know, so I, I will say that too. Uh, you know, um, I, I want to go back to. Uh, you know, the organizations you were talking about for people to follow and be part of. It's really true. And what I'm going to do in the show notes, everyone, is put a list of uh, organizations in the links <clears throat> for you to connect with. Um, one of them will be the National Parks Conservation Association. They're okay, very man. political. Yeah, they, they were one of our very first nas- uh, nonprofits. Um, American Forest uh, as well. There's all these organizations and you can do ones that are also very local and you can join local chapters, Audubon's like that, National Wildlife Federation. We've covered a lot with National Wildlife Federation and especially with uh, created a, a certified backyard habitat. It's the one thing you we yes. had Doug, uh, ecologist Doug Tallamy on our show talking about creating your own national park in your backyard for your kids to be yes. together. So you can watch raccoons and possums and, you know, all kinds of, you know, birds and things like that. So um, there's something about, you know, we promote travel, but responsible travel, which means parks, historic sites and, and public lands and things. But, you know, you don't have to go across the country or around the world to create a beautiful area around where you are, even if it's your balcony. If you live in an apartment in a balcony, you can do that. There's also parks you can probably go and volunteer with. So I, I will put a list of those um those places. I, I agree with you. The National Wildlife Federation, you know, I grew up reading Ranger Rick. And Ranger Rick was my, you know, when that sure. came every month, oh my gosh, I had all the projects, all of that. But our park systems do that too. We have junior rangers in the National Park Service. And I I watch the kids get the the adults involved. And that's the beauty of it, you know, yes. to see an entire family learn about a beetle. And we have beautiful rainbow scarab beetles in our country. Like, I mean, we, people don't think about them, but that habitat for them, like in Big Thicket in Texas, uh, Big Thicket National Preserve, you know, take them to a place like that. It's out swampy, but, you know, you can see carnivorous plants. And who? what kid doesn't want to learn about a pitcher plant that can that eats bugs? Come on. Yeah. It's fun. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I just, you know, there, there's so much to learn about. And we've got to do it because climate change is really affecting our species. Um, with all the weather changes, the glaciers melting, the temperature change really affects the species. So I think it goes 
really um, hand in hand. It's, you know, we want to save monarch butterflies and wolves and all these beautiful animals and, you know, certain plants. And, but I think this habitat part, like we talked about, uh, Lowell is, is really huge. And that's what the Endangered Species Act can really help that because <clears throat> in closing on this, when we go to fight for like a, like Biscayne, uh, National Preserve, Biscayne National Park, I don't know if it's a park or a preserve off the top of my head in South Florida, uh, Biscayne and all of that area, they're being threatened by oil and, um, Chaco Canyon up in northern New Mexico is threatened by fracking over and over. And just when you think you've won, somebody raises their hand or a new is, a slate of politicians get in and we have to fight again. So just if you fight once, know that you're going to have to fight again in the next few years. Uh, that is always how it is, but just keep doing it. But, um, with the Endangered Species Act from everything we've done on shows over the years on set, like standing up to things like the Dakota Access Pipeline and, you know, these oil issues and all of that. And I'm not against us not having things, but um, isn't the Endangered Species Act the tool to help us close down some of those things that can take out like biodiversity to an entire protected area that, well, if it's an endangered species in there, that gives us that that extra power to say that's enough of that. Not only will it protect endangered species, but it would protect a plethora of biodiversity. If if you know, so it's like a it's like a big powerful tool that we need in litigation. Well, it, it is that as well. Um, the other acts that support and were passed by the during the Nixon administration. Uh, around when the uh, 73 ESA uh, was enacted was the the National Environmental Protection Act, Mm. which goes right to the to the uh, the heart of the fossil fuel uh, industry in its development and fracking. Uh, The other uh, acts are the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. All of those together create a defense against the violation by our, our by not just the fossil fuel industry but foresters miners and other land use industries um, uh, coal like coal extraction and strip mining all of these go to trying to protect the environment mm. from the, the 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 ills that these various industries cause our environment. Mm. Uh, I'd I, like to. I'd like to before because I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time. I yeah. want to tell you about, about my next book that's coming out because yeah. it's a it's a synthesis of, of volumes one and two. My my publisher called me up uh, near the end of last year and he said, "Lowell, I've, I've you know I've read through what you you have put together here," and he said, "It's brilliant." But it's very, very technical, very, very much in the weeds. And he said, can you synthesize these for the general public in layman's language? And Mm. they they appointed a particular editor to work with me out of New York who really pushed me to uh, put in the human interest aspects of the Endangered Species Act over the next 50 years. Oh, wow. I have done, oh, I don't know, I lost track of 80 or 90 interviews on tape all around the country with land users, uh, academicians, um, um, conservationists, uh, and and, and the like, to really dig deep in my volumes one and two. And I, when I went back through my notes, I couldn't believe how many human interest stories I came across. Mm. Well, the, the next book is called Earth's Emergency Room, oh. which is what which is what the ESA Earth's Emergency Room is coming out on April twenty second of this year, which is oh, Earth Day. Day. Yay! Earth Day, and Wonderful. and it and it's it's filled with human interest stories. I mean, there is there's drugs, there's sex, oh. uh, there's fi- fist fights, there's. Oh. Uh, a murder and a suicide, a jail oh. time, 
and all of these things that came out of the enforcement of the Endangered Species Act. And it's wow. just an, it's an interesting read. My The big publisher, the, the guy that really is the senior e- editor, he said, I took your took that home when you sent sent it in, the final manuscript, not expecting to read it, but I'm, you know, I'm having my first cup of coffee on a Saturday morning. He said, I thought I'd see what you wrote. Just glance at it. He said, my God, I read the first page and I didn't put it down for about half a day. He wow. It was, it was so interesting, all of the tidbits that you were able to pull together, which, you know, had been buried in my notes. But that's coming out on April 22nd. I love it. I love it. And, Please come back. I yeah. want to read it. And, I want to read well, it. I think, well, I think that's but, where you're getting to, Margo, about having that human connection, right? Yes, right. it's um, important. We need to know so we can help on our end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, well, the, when you when you do put that list out of organizations, you ought to put the my um, special uh, website that I've created just to advertise and broadcast the Endangered Species Act's many pieces. It's mm-hmm. called ESA, and it's not the at sign with circle around it. It's AT, ESA at 50.com. And okay, if you got it. That, if you if you put that in your computer, the synthesis, the you know the 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 uh, abridged version of the books are in there, the histories in there, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And it it I, I really was spending, I spent an afternoon recently with Wendell Berry. You remember the name Wendell Berry? Yes. Well, I I was on a book tour doing a speech out in uh, Louisville, and mm-hmm. I knew Wendell lived near there, and I I, I contacted him and. He was less than an hour out, out. So I went out and spent an afternoon with that gentleman. And wow. he really he really gave me some, some some something to think about, which I'm my mind is just churning now for another book. And and when I overlay, if you overlay the development of the agribusiness community that turned much of our farmland into monoculture mm-hmm. agriculture. Um the uh, biodiversity crisis and when that started, and then climate change. Just overlay all of those, one on top of the mm-hmm. other. And all of a sudden, there are certain connections that are starting to come through. Mm-hmm. I just began to, began to reach searches. But I'm saying, my God, there are more forces at work here than perhaps I'd really recognized. And ag- the agribusiness community has been... Uh, non-existent from the standpoint of of our ecology in this country and protecting our species. And so I want to dig, dig into that this some more. So we'll see where that That's oh, what I'm thinking well, about right now. Well, I, I, I love your work and what you're doing. And if you ever need examples of things from parks, call me because I'm seeing things. I do see some um, agricultural communities realize um, that they need to change and they're making changes. And um, doing work to be more coexistent, and you can see the difference. Um, you know, the Colorado River, just one example, real quick, and I know we have to all go. The Colorado River, lower Colorado River in Yuma, Arizona, um, at the river itself, they had, it's actually the uh, Colorado River National Heritage Area is there. And I mean, the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area, sorry, but they recreated these parks on top of landfills along the edge of the river and put in a solar farm, put in gardens for birds, hummingbird gardens with native plants. They took out the invasive species all along the riverbanks. 49 agencies came together, including two Native American tribes, BLM, all of it, state parks, uh, federal, everybody got together to clean up this portion of the of the Colorado River. And I, I have to tell you, the beaver came back. People didn't even realize that the Arizona has beaver. They came back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the cottonwoods are there. Certain birds are coming back. Nancy and I kayaked at the from the confluence of the Gila River and the and the Colorado River in Yuma, um, down to where the the little parks are where you can go hang out and have, you know, a picnic and everything. And so we we go down and at this point it this part hasn't been restored yet. You know, this was a few years back. And all of a sudden we get to the place of where they restored. And it was like somebody opened the curtains into nature land. It was un, 
unbelievable. All of a sudden, this wave, it was like a cacophony of birds, yeah. all kinds of birds, beaver tracks. I mean, it was like, we're alive. We were, and we basically before that were floating down a dead zone. And part of what was happening with the river too, with the invasive plants, and that was coming from what was going on in the farms, because this is a massive agricultural area. It's the um, lettuce capital of the world, uh, winter lettuce and leafy green capital. And so a lot of what was going on was, you know, pesticides, et cetera, um, just a lot. But through that, even farmers got on, on board and started to see the difference. And through seeing difference and actually making some positive change, positive change, that ripple effect can be just as big as negative change, if not bigger. And it works. Yeah. And it's amazing. Now you see families there. You see the wildlife there. I think it's really a positive thing. And when you see that happen, it helps your actual economics in a community as well. So who, who, led, that, who, who led that effort, Lisa? Uh, that was really the color, uh, excuse me, the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area. In fact, um, yeah, that, uh, I can, but I there can had to be, you. there had to be one or two people that really yes. got behind it and pulled there, everybody together. I don't have the guy's name, but it was actually the beginning of the heritage area. Uh, the city of Yuma was very involved. Uh, Tina Clark is a lady I know that was part of that and, and, they hired a consultant that um, also worked up in the Colorado River Plateau, Flagstaff, and all up through Arizona. And he came down. I actually saw him there because they're they're still working on it, and there's it's it's an ongoing progress uh, project. And now the the executive director is another Lowell <laughs> Lowell Perry. Uh, he he runs that, and I I'm happy to connect you. But they um they it, this guy came down and and they had these different trees that, and I'm thinking it was a Palo Verde tree now, and they couldn't get them to regrow. Like they couldn't open the seeds to, to scratch the seeds for the seeds for these trees to really grow properly. The guy sat out there uh, and it used to be called hobo camp because that's where all the homeless people lived. And so part of this was also like, now we have to address what is going on with our humans, you know? So, you know, this kind of thing, cleaning up land and restoring it, Often has these benefits that just you just can't even count them, and, and this dying. is one of those. This is amazing. Um, well, but, anyway, but so Lisa, he, he, Lisa, he did it. If you mm -hmm. really dug into that, you would find one or two key people that started sure. that movement, and it comes yeah. back to the power of one. Whenever I speak to groups around the country, I always say any one of you can lead an effort to 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 help our our universe. Any one of you. It just takes some energy and some direction. And yeah. so the power of one is very, very important in, in, in recognizing a story like that. Yes. Uh, you know what? I love it. I love that you say that. And look at your resume of what you've done. I mean, we'd be here for an hour, you know, reciting everything off your website. <laughs> Everyone can go to your website. And you definitely are exemplary at what you've done in, in proving that, you know, starting like you were saying, at 16 years old. We really appreciate this. Um, before you go, one quick thing. What got you to stand up for conservation? What was it for you that said, I got to stand up for, for the wild? I, 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 I grew into it. I was raised on a small uh, um, uh, row crop and dairy farm in uh, northern Indiana. Mm. Uh, we didn't have electricity or running water. We had an outdoor privy. And we didn't get electricity until I was leaving for college. We got it in April, and I left in August for, 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 for college. But I grew up in a rural environment. My grandfather loved the wilds, and he would take me out with him just, just to go tromping in the woods. He also had a, 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 a homestead ranch in Montana, and mm -hmm. occasionally I would go out there with him. And so, And he was always interested in just driving around and looking at things. And he'd point things out to me. So I really had a, you know, a, 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 an agrarian upbringing by some pretty good mentors. Mm, that's awesome. Mentors, mentorship, like you said earlier, is key yes. as well. Absolutely. Right. Well, I want to give out your website again, everyone. It's ESA for the Endangered Species Act, AT at 50, representing the 50 years. It's the 50 year anniversary that we're celebrating dot, of dot, the endangered. Dot com. Yes. Dot com. So, 
ESA at 50.com is the website. It'll be linked in the show notes and also keep up with Lowell at Lowell Bear, uh, at Lowell E Bear.com. That's B A I E R. So Lowell E Bear, B A I E R.com. And of course, keep up at Margo, Margo Carrera.etsy.com. Right? Did I get it right, Margo? We'll get there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here. We're here every fourth. Friday at BigBlendRadio.com. We appreciate you all. Let's get outside in nature. I'm going to go take a walk in the snow. I just learned that squirrels can actually smell their feet, their food one feet through snow. How incredible is that? So that's what I'm yeah. going to go do. I'm going to look for that's squirrels. Unbe- but they do it. I've watched them. They're unbelievable. <laughs> and they have to haul because there's bald eagles out here. So they go, yeah. go squirrel, go. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lowell. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio's Nature Connection Show. Follow us at BigBlendRadio.com and keep up with Margo at MargoCarrera.etsy.com.